Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you very much because we are gathered, not for play, but we gathered at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we can hear what you have to speak to us tonight. O oh Lord, we pray that there will be nothing between us and you. You will speak to our hearts, and you will give us ears of children, and we will listen to you and be obedient in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, that false love that makes us to yearn and to long and to be desirous, hearing from the Father, hearing from the Spirit of God, you grant to every one of us tonight in Jesus' name. We pray, O oh Lord, we will not be among the people who will come under the condemnation of being lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, not interested in the word of the Father. Give us, Lord, a burning desire to hear you more and more in Jesus' name. Let your spirit speak to every heart. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, as we come to our Bible study, we still come to James chapter 4, and we're looking at verse 4. If you are very observant, you'll see that we looked at this verse last week, and yet we come back to it again today. There must be a reason why the Spirit of the Lord is bringing us back to the same verse once again. James chapter 4, reading from verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The verse itself is very, very clear. What may surprise some people, especially those who are reading that for the first time, those who are not familiar with the language of Scripture, is a strong term or the strong words that are used in that verse. The words are like adulterers, adulteresses, and then enmity with God. And then underlining it by saying, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, not that he was, not that he will be in the future, in the present tense, is today the enemy of God. Actually, that will not be the first time that James will be talking about the relationship of the Christian with the world. In James chapter 1, reading from verse 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. And then it says, to keep himself unspotted from the world. From the very beginning, that is, from the very first chapter, James makes us to know that the world association with the world will make you dirty, will make you defiled, will make you to be spotted. That if you are going to have pure religion, and you are going to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth, and you are going to serve the Lord acceptably, there is something, there is one thing the Lord is requesting from you, you will keep yourself unspotted from the world. Actually, as you look at the language of uh, James, you cannot but think of the relationship we sustain and maintain with the Heavenly Father. I told you last week, it's a love relationship, an intimate relationship. That's why the sin of yielding to the influence of Satan who controls the world is going to be a sin against the love of God. Our relationship with the Lord is not that of a king and a subject, or the master and the slave. It's that intimate relationship of husband and wife. You know what it means then? When we go back into sin and we give our hearts to the world, actually that breaks the heart of our God in heaven. It's like when a partner in a marriage goes to give his heart or her heart to another person outside the marriage. That individual would have committed adultery. That's why it says, 
this turning back to the world, being a friend of the world, loving the world, and being involved with the practices and the principles and the pollutions and the perversions of the world is actually spiritual adultery. And just like it breaks the heart of the husband, if the wife will turn away from the Lord, it breaks the heart of God. It actually says it makes us enemies of God. When you are so influenced and you are so dominated by the pursuit and the pleasures of this world, that the world now dictates your attitude, your desires, your taste, your lifestyle, your action, it means that you have shifted away from where you were, and now the Bible looks at you as if you've turned your back on God, and now you become an enemy of God. You see, those who abhor affection for the world, and the things that the world is promising or affording, they cannot claim to remain the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the thoughts, the actions, the principles and the uh, practices of the world are a continual, constant digression from the Lord. And the purpose and the pursuit of worldliness is not to support spirituality. It's actually opposed to holiness and heaven-mindedness. That's why every movement of the life of the worldly person is towards satisfying sinful desires and pleasures. And the people that live and die in worldliness, in friendship with the world, partnership with the world, communion with the world, if they die in that condition, they die as enemies of God. And to see the face of the Lord on the final day will be something impossible. We're going to look at three points in the message we're looking at today. Number one, the danger of worldliness. The danger of worldliness. Number two, the dressing of the worldly. The dressing of the worldly. And then number three, deliverance from the evil world. Let's come back to James chapter 4 and look at that verse 4 once again. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Pointed, isn't it? Very direct, isn't it? Then it says, have you been a Christian? Have you been in the fold? Have you learned a uh, Christian doctrine? Don't you know then that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore is talking about anyone inside or outside, anyone that claims to be a Christian or even a leader or even a worker, a man or a woman he may be or she may be, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Such a language used by James actually terrifies a person that has a fear of God. Because, you know, that language classifies a person that loves the world with people like Herod, with people like Pharaoh, people like Ahab and Jezebel. It classifies a person like that with Judas Iscariot and all the other people that hated God and opposed God and he faced the eternal consequence. Anyone, therefore, that neglects the message of James chapter 4, verse 4, does so at his own peril. Look at the constant and uniform testimony of Scripture as he tells us about this problem of worldliness and the danger it poses to the spiritual life of the one that has come to know the Lord. We're looking at Mark chapter 4, verse 19. Mark chapter 4, reading from verse 19. Please open your Bible. Here we've come for Bible study. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the loss of other things entering in choke the world and it becometh unfruitful. When you study the word of God, notice some points there. And notice uh, those words that are used there. Don't just pass over. It says, entering in, which means it wasn't there before. And you can begin to look at your life now. The things that were not there before. When you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you gave your soul, your future, everything there is about you. You gave to the Lord. And you said, Lord, I'm following you. 
the wall behind me, the cross before me. God is preparing another kingdom. I will be there. Whatever it will take. I count the things of this world as dung and dross. That's when you knew the Lord. But as the time went on, some other things entering in that were not there before. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. Many other things that the people of the world are pursuing, entering in. What does it do? There's a danger now of holiness. It chokes the world so that the world becomes unfruitful. That means... The word will not be of effect in your heart anymore. The salvation experience will not be real anymore. If you hear any new word concerning sanctification, concerning fellowship with the Lord, concerning worship, concerning anything, commitment, consecration to the Lord, the word you are hearing every time you come, whether it's retreat or normal study, will not be any fruit. You know why? Because there is worldliness there and the clutches of the devil, the claws of that wild animal. It chokes the world and the world does not bear fruit. As Mark is warning us through the words of Jesus Christ, as James is warning us through the word given by the Holy Ghost, so John, the beloved, is warning us to him. First John, first John chapter 2, first John chapter 2, reading from verse 15, love not the world, Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Here you will see here the unity of the Bible. You know what James said? He said, whosoever. You know what John is saying? John says, if any man, that's the same, whosoever, any man, any man, any woman, whosoever. Once the love of the world enters in, the love of God goes out. That's what we are being told here. Then he tells us what comprises of that love of the world. For all that's in the world, verse 16, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. What in it doesn't stay at the same point. The devil is always bringing some other things. It's like, you know, it's expanding and extending and intensified. And it says it is passing away. Way, and the loss thereof, and then it says, only those that do the will of the Father will abide forever. I pray God will give you the grace to do the will of the Father. In Second Peter, Second Peter chapter two, reading from verse twenty, Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, stop there for a moment. That's what happens when we are born again. Because the Christian is called out of the world. He escapes the pollutions of the world. But if, after that experience of salvation, he is again now, he has escaped through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. That's actually the danger that uh, the Bible is warning us about, that if we allow the things of the world, the practices of the world, the principles of the world, the pollutions and perversions of the world, the philosophy and the politics of the world, if we allow those things to come back again and then take us over, overcome us, and then make us to just follow them, and we leave the way of the Lord, because you cannot walk on those two roads at the same time. The way of the Lord and the way of the world. They are very different and they are opposite. If you are walking in one, then you have abandoned the other one. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. From verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. Now this is an apostle, he tells us that whenever he spoke to these people, and even when he was writing and talking to them at this time, he was weeping. Why? Because it says, for they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, who glory in their shame, who mind as they say. There's something I want you to notice. James was an important key figure in the early church. 
John was an important key figure in the early church. Peter was an important key figure in the early church. And Paul was an important key figure, the greatest of the apostles in the early church. Think about it. Among those four people, James, John, Peter, and Paul, they wrote together 22 books of the New Testament, all out of the 27 books. You understand then, those people, forefront apostles, champions of apostles, the greatest of the apostles, combined together, each one of them, they saw the importance of what we are talking about, and they said, Christians, children of God, family of God, worldliness is dangerous, and it will choke your Christian life, it will destroy your Christian life, and the thing you need to do is just to make sure that you avoid it, because if you get into it, you become an adulterer in the sight of God, you become an adulteress in the sight of God. There are many people that will say, but many other Christians are doing it. And they're going in that direction. Have you forgotten the days of Noah? That even though the majority of the people of the world, they were doing that thing, that didn't stop God from bringing judgment unto them. Judgment still came unto them. If it's only one person that is obedient to the Lord, that's the person that will get to heaven. The Lord is not going to change his standard just because the majority of the people of the world have gone after the things of the devil. Let's go to point number two you. Here is one thing now, very, very important as we talk about worldliness, uh, because, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning, and then you are going out into the world, and there is a thought in your heart, how will the world look at me? How will I fit into my uh, community where I'm going in the world? And there is something that points you out. is the kind of dress you wear. So we cannot really conclude talking about worldliness, except we look at what the Bible says concerning the dressing of the worldly. And the Bible has a lot to say about it. Just open your Bible, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 3. We're reading it from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 3. We're reading it from verse 16. Isaiah chapter 3. Reading it there from verse 16. Here are the words of the Lord himself. Isaiah 3 verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty. Please stop for a moment. We accuse that we emphasize on women. We accuse that as we treat a subject like this, we come so heavily on women. If you are a person that treats the Bible, that loves the Bible, that is devoted to the Bible, you want to take the Bible at its face value. There are men and women in Israel. There were men and women in Israel. And yet, at this time, Almighty God himself, he focused on the women in the land. Because there was something peculiar that he needed to touch upon in their lives. He said, moreover, the Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty. He's telling us, as we look at all these uh, things, external, uh, outward, the dressing, the appearance, the look, the things we put on. Actually, all those things are motivated by something within, pride. Haughtiness. It is the haughtiness and the pride within that produces all those things. And so it says, because they are haughty and they walk with stretch forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and musing as they go, and making a twinkling uh, with their feet. You see the details that God Almighty Himself that He went into. You know, some people, they read only one part of the Bible. And the only verse they know in the Bible, God does not look at the outward man, but he looks on the inside. And once they uh, choose that, or they quote that Bible, they close the Bible, they say, Amen, good night, praise the Lord, I can wear whatever I want. And then pride takes over. But you know the word of God here, it, it talks about the way they were walking and the wanton eyes, and the appearance, and then it begins to even mention some other things. If you look at it from verse 18, it mentions 
a, a number of things. And then verse 19, the chains, and then the bracelets. You come to verse 20, it mentions the ornaments of the legs, and the headbands, and then the earrings. In verse 21, and the rings, and the nose jewels. He goes on to verse 22, and the changeable suits of apparel, and so on and so forth. So you understand then, God is concerned by the things that we wear. And if the things we are wearing, if they are motivated by pride, if the things we are wearing, they are motivated by show, by wanting to publicize something. And you want to show people how beautiful perhaps you are, not how good God is, but how beautiful you are. That's pride. And God resists the proud. In Second Kings chapter 9, Second Kings chapter 9, verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her head and looked out at a window. That's a very, very clear. If you're a real child of God, there's something you don't want to do as a man. You want to avoid Judas Iscariot as a woman. You want to avoid Jezebel. There is nobody that will get a son and name him Judas Iscariot. Therefore, you shouldn't behave like Judas Iscariot. There is no one that will have a daughter and name her Jezebel. Therefore, you shouldn't ask. Like Jezebel, the painting of the fingers, of the toes, of the eyelashes, of those things, is not of God. The people that did it in Bible days, they were the people that didn't know God, they didn't love God, they didn't accept the word of the Lord. While we're still in the Old Testament, please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy chapter 22. And let us see the word of God. There in verse 5, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. I know that, uh, you know, some people when they read that, they say, but that's Old Testament. But Old Testament says, I am the Lord that healeth you. And you grab that where you go with it. Old Testament says, bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Forget not only all his benefits, that forgiveth all thine iniquities, and healeth all thy diseases. Praise the Lord, it is mine. Old Testament says, no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper. But every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. It's the heritage of the people of God. Say, yes, praise the Lord, it is mine. Old Testament says, the anointing breaks the yoke. And then you are the deliverance ministry. Old Testament now says, the woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man. That is Old Testament. Wait a minute. Look at that verse. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. What if in the choir of those people, their choir members, uh, the men, appearing up and down with a scalp? They'll drive them away. They'll drive them, uh, they'll drive them back home. They say, you are mad. Something is wrong with you. Something is not correct upstairs. But it's the same verse that says, a man shall not wear that, per that pertains to a woman. The same verse says, a woman shall not wear that that pertains to a man. All that do so, they are abomination in the sight of the Lord. You understand then, when a lady cuts her hair, bows her head, just like the men. It's an abomination. It is not right. It will be the same as if the man were to leave the air long and to be weaving the air. As that will be abomination, it is abomination for the woman also to cut the air. I'm not talking of the people that have some kind of problem or disease and the air is falling up. That's another thing. We're talking of the people that deliberately do that and they're doing it in the name of fashion. It is not the will of God. God doesn't want anything like that and we need to stay with scripture I thank God for a church like this and I pray that the good thing God has given us we will not lose it in Jesus name Whatever others do, others may, we will not We will stand on the word of God in Jesus name 
Whenever I see people like you wanting to take in the word of God saying, yes, if the Bible says so, I want to stand by it. What an encouragement you are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're looking at it from verse 5 and then in verse 6. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, but every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she was shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her Ha, be covered. When you come to the house of God, already I've told you, you'll not cut your hair. You will do something very neat. You're not doing something to attract anybody. All you want is to attract the Lord. All you want is to do what the Lord wants in First Timothy. First Timothy, reading from chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, from verse 9. It says, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. Modest, underline that word in your Bible. Once it is immodest, it becomes immoral. Once it is immodest, it becomes unrighteous. Let it be moderate and let it be modest. It says modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. You will not be a person that is loud and lousy. You will not be a person that is free with laws and you are doing it for show. You will not be a person that will dress like those uh, public women. There will be that shamefacedness there. There will be that sobriety there. And it says not with broided ear. Very clear, very definite. Now what it means with broided ear here, in the olden days, what those old would the women will do, that's the women of the world, in the Gentile world, they will weave the ear, they'll put some beads, they'll put some gold, they'll put some things there. That's what they call the weaving or the broiding of the ear. And it says, uh, that's what you call attachment today. That whether you are a girl, a born again girl, or a born again woman, you will not have that kind of thing and then it says not gold and it says not pearls and it says not costly array you have seen now in the word of god how the word of god is very very clear and if we're children of god uh, the way if we're not part of the mixed multitude that standard of the word of god is what we're to follow and if salvation is there, that's what we are going to follow every time. On the wedding day, if salvation is there, on the day you are doing the burial of your old father, your old mother, or granny, or whatever, if salvation is there, you will stay by the watch of God. On the day you want to follow somebody to their wedding or reception, reception does not cancel salvation. If you are doing reception in the marriage, in the, for the people wedding, if salvation is still there, if commitment to the word of God is still there, the same standard that we have here is the same standard we will have every time when you come to church you dress normally when you are going to your working place in the bank or anywhere you are you will stand on that same word of god or are we going to be like those who are angels and the church and devils outside it should be the same thing what of when you're having the mean ceremony you've got a wife now you have got a child that is when some people they lose their head they lose their understanding. They lose their conviction. They lose all the things they have learned from Bible study to Bible study. From retreat to retreat. Today is for naming ceremony. And the drumming comes in. And the records com come in. And the almost dancing will come in. And the drinking and everything will come in. And worldliness proper. Worldliness. Uh, real worldliness will come in. It should not be so. Whether it is naming ceremony. Or it is wedding time. Or it is burial. The same word of God, the same sobriety, the same shamefacedness, the same moderation will be in our lives. We will follow the Lord all the time. Look at your outline now. There are seven reasons why you should not get involved in that kind of foolish, sinful, unrighteous display of, uh, you know, the worldly dressing, number one. Because it is condemned in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. 
Number two, because it is a sinful waste of the money of the Lord. Number three, because it is immodest, and if it is immodest, it's immoral, it's unrighteous. Number four, because it fosters, it promotes pride. Number five, because it promotes the lust of the flesh. Number six, it's a mark of, the, of worldly com, uh, conformity. It's like you are flowing in the stream of the world, and the, and the wave of the, of, the, of, the, of the river is just uh, pushing you on, and you are now under Satan's control. Number seven, because it's the exact opposite of what the Bible and God the Father, what He commands His own children. And as children of God, our commitment is that now I have come into the kingdom of God, I am going to stand by the word of God. I'm praying that if there is any mistake, if there is any kind of shaking in our conviction tonight, you'll be faithful to the Lord. And the Lord will wash and cleanse us whiter than snow, will be what we ought to be in Jesus' name. Actually, the power is in the hand of the Lord. All that we need, if you need any cleansing, if you need any readjustment, revival, renewal of your Christian life, and if you need any improvement in your obedience to the word of the Lord, the Lord will do it tonight. I say the Lord will do it tonight. That leads us to point number three, deliverance from the evil world. Deliverance from the evil world. Actually, the Lord has not left us alone to struggle on our own, to try on our own. He will help us once we invite him in. It's the work of the Lord in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Who himself, talking about Jesus Christ from verse 3, who himself... Gave, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. The meaning of the verse is, anything that is evil in this present evil world. When you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, anything the Lord will see and will not be happy. The corruptions of the world, the pollutions of the world, the perversions of the world, all those practices of the one we spoke about last week, anything that is not of God in this present world, you come to the Lord, He will deliver you from them in Jesus' name. In Second Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, reading there from verse 4. It says, whereby a giving unto us is the gift of God, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, by, by these ye might be partakers of a divine nature. I'm telling you, that divine nature that God himself imparts into us, when we become children of God, that nature hates the devil. That nature hates anything coming from the devil. That nature hates the corruption and the pollution that's in the world. As long as that nature of God is still inside you, is still inside us, there will be hatred for those perversions and pollutions of the world. And then it says, it is that nature that makes us to be partakers of his very nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. It makes us to totally, completely escape in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11 and verse 12. Titus chapter 2 from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. I believe it has appeared to you. I said I believe it has appeared to you. There is no doubt you are not a stranger to the grace of God now. But you know, when that grace of God comes, it teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live how? Soberly. They don't live soberly in the world. They are loud, they are lousy, they are frivolous, they are corrupt, they are perverted, and they, they put on the dress, and they put on dress not to cover nakedness, to display their nakedness. Those are the people in the world. But for us, it says, we live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. I believe it's possible and it's possible for you and for me. And we are not of the world. Even Jesus Christ, he testified concerning the believers. Look at John in the gospel according to St. John chapter 17. Reading there from verse 14 all through to verse 16. John 
chapter 17 from verse 14. I have given them thy word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Oh how I pray. That same testimony that Jesus gave concerning those early disciples, he will give that testimony about you. He will look at your life. He will look at your dressing. He will look at your wardrobe. He will look at your walking. If he will look at your ceremonies, naming ceremony, wedding ceremony, everything, and then he'll be able to say, "Father, look at this young man. Father, look at this woman. He is not of the world. She is not of the world, even as I'm not of the world." In verse 16, he repeated it again: "They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world." I pray the Lord will do every everything that is necessary within you and within me so that this great work will be done in Jesus name before I close I want to remind you of what Jesus Christ himself said before he went away we're looking at Luke chapter 17 Luke chapter 17 and I'm reading from verse 26 Luke chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 26 and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, and they drank, and they, and, and they married, they married wives, and they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, uh, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, and they drank, and they bought, and they sold sold and they planted and they built it but the same day that Lord went out of Sodom it rained fire and brimstone uh, from heaven and destroyed them all even though shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed verse 32 remember Lord's wife I want to remind you of the story those angels they came to Sodom and Gomorrah it was a day of salvation for them it was a day of a came from the judgment of God. And those angels, they told Lord, they said, do you have anybody here? Anybody that is still lost in the world, go and get them. Because if they remain in the world, if they love those things of the world, and they are glued, and they are tied to those things of the world, they'll perish of the world. Go and tell them. And uh, Lord, he went out, he told them, I don't know how he preached to them, I don't know how he explained to them, but it was like he was joking. Do you count me as some Somebody joking tonight and you see the way I'm talking and you're just laughing within yourself is come again that's the way you used to do whenever he's talking about that you don't know the last message you will hear before the trumpet will sound and then when the angels saw that they were wasting time the Bible says they were lingering he took hold of the hand of Lord and took hold of the hand of a Lord's wife I'm telling you the greatest opportunity for anybody in Genesis the greatest opportunity for anybody in the Old Testament to be saved, to escape the judgment of God, Lord's wife had the opportunity. And then they told them, you see the mountain there? Don't stay in the valley. Don't stay in the valley. Go higher. Go higher in the Lord. Higher ground. That's the thing that will take you to heaven. Therefore, go to the top of the mountain. And then don't look behind you. And then as they were going, fire came in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord's wife. The jewelry was not in the ear, it was in the heart. The powder was not in the face, it was in the heart. All those things of the world, then she said, uh-uh, is it how everything will finish? That's why Jesus said, remember Lord's wife. She looked back like this, when we get to heaven, you will not find Lord's wife. Shall we find you on that day? Will you be there? Or is it because of the dressing, because of the hairdo, because of the jewelry, because of the high heel, because of the television, because of the naming ceremony, because of the things of the world, because of their eating and drinking, because of their marrying and giving in marriage, because of their wedding and ceremony, because of their burial and funeral. Why don't you call upon the Lord? You will not be lost on that final day. The love of God has come to you tonight. Embrace the love of God. Accept the love of God. Do not perish with Sodom and Gomorrah. Whosoever, whosoever loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And anybody, anybody that will be a friend of the world, he will be an enemy of God. Why don't you rise up and pray and talk to the Lord? I will not be an enemy of God. 
I will not be an enemy of God. I will not be an enemy of God. I will not be an enemy of God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to love God. I will not allow the things of the world to take me away from the Lord. Make your commitment. Make your consecration. The Lord will help you. The grace of God is sufficient for every one of us.